Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Peter Robinson and today we've got Lachlan Robb who's going to tell us about the work he's been doing in his PhD. So um, Lachlan, um, can you please um, introduce yourself and tell us uh, what you're going to Sure, I'll um, share my screen. You guys can all hear me? Excellent. Um, so, hi, my name's Lachlan Robb. I'm a lecturer at QUT, which is the Queensland University of Technology here in Brisbane, Australia. And um, I teach contract law and I also conduct research into law and technology. Specifically, I look at the use of blockchain I don't really go into too much around questions of like you know, legality or legislation, but rather I'm more socially driven. So I look more at law as like a set of rules and control, something that can be softer and more organic than this pure idea of law. As such, when it came to completing a PhD, I decided to look at people rather than the law and specifically how coders and blockchain developers engage with it. How when questions of law and society and structures and rules kind of organically emerge out of that sort of process. Um, yeah, I, I'll uh, get stuck into what I have to say then. Yeah, <laughs> please do. It, it, no, no, no. Look, this sounds really good. So um, please, yeah, tell us all about it. Cool. So um, some of you may be familiar with a blockchain project called Beef Ledger. Um, if you're not, they were a Brisbane-based company which developed a blockchain system that looked at beef and cattle exports. The idea was that through blockchain, they could actually recast the Australian approach to the beef supply chain with a specific focus on the Chinese market. Uh, my research was something known as an ethnography. Um, that's basically something which places a researcher as something akin to uh, like an anthropologist. So if you think of like an academic type going to visit some tropical island to study a local tribe for like 10 years and write books about it, that's kind of what I did, except the tribe I followed around were made of blockchain coders. So slightly different. Um, but I spent six months intensely working with them, for them, sitting in the back corner, helping out where I could. Um, I even followed the team over to China in November, 2019, before the world all shut down. Um, I need to be involved enough with them to understand what's happening, but not so far ingrained that I kind of changed or guided the actions of those who I was observing. And today, I kind of want to talk to you about some of those stories that I found, some of the ways that it may, you know, be a tad familiar to you, um, but I'm hoping that some of the ideas I raise are a bit of a unique way of looking at these sorts of things. So I'm assuming many of you are familiar with the idea of code is law. It's a bit of an overused concept sometimes and it highlights a bit of a simple, you know, binary almost understanding of what truly actually restrains the actions of some coders, if not yourselves. And I'm sure you may know someone who definitely subscribes to this sort of philosophy of coding. That, you know, the code is being created is the text. It is, you know, the extent of the rules that are bound by the people who use them. That, you know, if there is a command, it will restrict. If there's an error, it can be exploited. If there's no prohibition, that's essentially permission. Um, it can be a bit of simplification, simplification of this attitude or ethos, but it's one that can be traced through, you know, your crypto anarchic types to your cypherpunks, to your code puritans, to your wannabe script kiddies and everything in between. And in the world of coders, the code can be law. Beyond the computer and beyond what's compiled, though, the company behind the technology needs to deal with a different type of law. That's the law as this force of the state, something with legislation, codes, rules, criminal repercussions. The idea of law is not something that they're creating, but sometimes it's almost this foe that they need to keep an eye on. They need to avoid crossing it or to try to outwit it. To speak to a bit of a fledging startup sometimes, the idea of law and legality of what they're creating is something to be dealt with maybe you know later on in the beta phase or maybe even later. Um, it's a conversation stopper sometimes to mention law to coders. It's a question that raises eyebrows and you know speaks to the ideas that perhaps you're not there to create or innovate like they are. Law is almost a rude, rude word, you could even say. When a project does eventually consult a lawyer, sometimes they view them as the gatekeeper that says no and snatches away the hope of existing that state of legality within society. I'm being a bit colorful here, but you, you kind of get the idea, right? <laughs> Despite this picture, though, my research is kind of almost telling a different story because that's a little bit of the myth behind it all. But it's not really what I started seeing when I dealt with coders looking at blockchain. 
Um, it's not always that of entrepreneurs seeing law as enemy, but instead to show that technology and those aspirations of the projects aren't actually too far removed from the idea. The companies may be engaged in a similar enterprise to that of the law. Their internal view isn't this full thing. They don't see what they're doing as something law-like, but they actually see tend to see law as this apparatus of the state. And that what they're building is a separate creation to fix and build a new future, not necessarily as comp competition with the state systems, but maybe a purer expression. They believe that they can see and identify laws that, you know, a coder can see laws, acts, regulations, and then choose to, you know, engage with the bits they need to. And, you know, if they're particularly savvy, they believe they can kind of weave in and out and, you know, engage where they need to, and the, potentially they'll survive that legal gauntlet and be able to proudly say they are legally compliant or, you know, at least not illegal in that moment. And instead, though, law can be seen more holistically as an expression of humanity, order, and time. And this is the sort of approach that I tend to find, that law and the legal apparatus exist because we as humans want to create a structural certainty about our future. That through certain structures, norms, traditions, we can begin to set the future in a way that we can actually plan for with our lives. It's about acting in the present in order to have some certainty into the future. That is law, after all. The way that people achieve this is through, you know, a wide range of institutional tools. And at this point in modernity, we've done this through laws, cases, paper, rules, and through professionals called lawyers. But a lot of times we've done this through myth or storytelling or through tradition and common law. The recurring idea of this desire, though, is to remove the terror of the darkness, to give order to the unknown, all that so we can actually exist now in the present. In this social idea of law, we can also start to see ideas of law and normative order as being expressions of time. That law involves thinking about the future and taking active steps in the present to achieve these future goals. There is a well-known philosopher and legal theorist known as Thomas Hobbes. He's famous for his statements and expressions of sovereignty in the state of nature. He um, viewed humanity as being something solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. But he also tapped into an inherent temporal mastery within this domain of law. For Hobbes, it's seen through a concept known as prudence. This is expressible as a presumption of the future contracted from the experience of past time, which in a simpler form means that we as a society, society should be able to decide what to do, how to act, how to engage with the law and society, because we know based on our past actions, how the future will respond to what we're doing right now. It's all about that knowledge based on what's happened in the past. It can also be known as the rule of law. It can be broken down further into three qualities, a clear concern with the present, an expressed desire to fix these problems and concerns, and a confidence that the tools being used now will actually be able to reach into the future and give order and structure. These qualities are clearly expressed through my observations of Beef Ledger as a blockchain entrepreneurial project. And this is where the blockchain comes back in. So we're back to tech, don't worry. <laughs> the first element, clear concern, it's seen within these sorts of projects, within the aims and aspirations of coders and entrepreneurs. They had a concern with what was happening now. This is more than just the promise of decentralized currencies or an economic argument, um, but more of a bigger problem seen around the world. Specifically for my project, they looked mostly at issues of food fraud and trust in the export system. Those are problems happening now, or were happening at the time, especially in China, that there was uncertainty about the meat they were actually receiving, where it was coming from, if it was the right cuts. And so using blockchain, there was a way to potentially enhance that system to then bring more um, provenance back into it so there was certainty back in. There was a problem in the present. There was a clear concern with that as to why they were choosing to act. Second one, they expressed a desire to fix this. They were standing forward, screaming loudly that you know their blockchain is the solution, that they can or even must be the ones who have the solution here. And it's not a matter of overconfidence or hubris even, but often just recognizing that they have the tools to actually do something, to choose the you know human aspect of the technology that blockchain was promoting. And finally, the coders, they had a clear confidence that blockchain and their solutions could actually reach forward, create a strong, you know, unbroken chain, and that this would actually give the stability needed to move forward. Through my research, the blockchain entrepreneurs I work with did indeed have a vision of a future where the real and digital were things that worked together to make life less problematic. They were consciously trying to build something that reached forward in time and renders it coherent. It was a normative ordering that they were seeing. They wanted to build a brave new world, and yes, it was one which could be sold and profits could be made from. But these expressions of belief that I observed were typical of that utopian ideal that a lot of coders and entrepreneurs tend to have. 
And it's simply built on ideas of how people will interact into the future all within that system with that confidence. To that end, you know, coders can engage in that action of law work. They were creating certainty into the future, but with the tool of technology and blockchain, not with rules, legislation, and the backing of the state. And so in this way, perhaps coders and lawyers are not so different. But why does it matter? So I'm not simply trying to say this to try and make sure these two groups stop seeing each other as a villain, but rather try and point out a few things. Some perhaps unintended consequences within this evolving state of affairs. And to do that, we need to look back to the nature of the tools of these coders, you know, the blockchain itself. Um, regardless of name and application of blockchains, they share key qualities of distribution, security, truth, and in the tech that's shared. It's secured through code, and this all kind of comes together to create an archive that's generally believed. I want to highlight, though, one key feature that blockchains tend to share. So it isn't really unique, but is still important that blockchains have a quality definable as technological management. This means that they're both a subject of regulation, you know, that there's a need to regulate how the technology is used, but the tech itself is something capable of actually regulating other actions. Because it's code, it's restrictive. It can allow things to either happen or not. You can either upload something or not. It's not like a car where it can literally be driven anywhere, limited only by terrain or gravity. Instead, code, like a blockchain, is capable of actually restricting actions. This idea of technological management is explained by the theorist Brownsword through an example of a geolocking golf cart. So geolocking is referring to the idea that something like a golf cart can be set within key boundaries and it just can't physically move beyond that. These days you see it a lot in uh, supermarket trolleys, so you can't steal it beyond the uh, scope of the parking lot. But the example that um, Brownsville goes into is the idea of a golf course. Work with me here. <laughs> so let's say there's a golf course and there's some elderly uh, members of the golf course who want to uh, have golf carts. They are getting a bit old. They don't want to have to walk around the whole time. They go to the, um, the owner of the course, their mate, and say, can we get golf carts? And he's like, oh, no, they're going to be expensive. They're going to tear up the greens. And they say, actually, no, don't worry. We promise. We, we know you. We promise we will not do anything. We will not drive them on the greens. And the owner says, okay, that's fine. So he gets the golf carts, brings them in. And, you know, these people respect the rules. There's this moral rule to what's happening here. There's no actual law. There's no actual rule set down. It's more of a built on respect for the person. But that doesn't always work when it gets scaled up. New people join the golf course. They don't actually know the owner. They don't really care about the owner. They just drive it wherever they want. So the owner has to come around and go, officially, here is the rule. You will not drive on the golf course. But that doesn't actually stop anyone. Because unless you actually respect the rule, unless you know about the rule, it becomes this prudential sort of concept that it just tells you don't do this or maybe don't do this or else. But there's still ways around it. People still drive on the golf course. So he goes, okay, I'm going to bring some tech in. I'll bring in a security camera. So he installs a security camera so you can see what's happening. But, you know, that's fallible too. The power goes off, doesn't capture it. The guy monitoring it could be bribed. There's always these little loopholes that could be exploited. And so he brings in the idea of the impossible rule. He brings in the geolocking golf carts. This is through technology. He's decided that you literally cannot drive this onto the golf course. It uses GPS. It physically cannot be put there. Everything's fixed, sort of, because what this means is that this person in charge of the golf course has said it cannot happen, and technology is now restricting human actions. What happens if there's an emergency? If, say, one of these elderly people who started off needing it dislocates their knee or breaks a leg or something right in the middle of the green, it'd be really nice to be able to bring that golf cart right up to them to be able to get them out of there, but they can't do it. The technology has completely restricted what can happen. Because of this idea of this rule, he's then made it impossible to actually change your mind in the state of emergency or to interpret it slightly differently. And this person is not a regulator. This person is not a lawyer. This person is, I'm not saying he has to be, but through the actions of just a simple piece of technology, you can start to create rules that actually restrict. This is technological management. And this is what we actually see within blockchain. There's a straightforward way of showing these different types of rules and regulations deployed socially. It starts with something that's that moral rule that people won't do something because they know it's wrong and they wouldn't want to damage the property of the owner they respect. But as time goes on, that same moral compulsion and respect is now reflected in the new members 
and then it's not. The community grows, it has to evolve into that prohibitive rule, one that's ought not or should not, and that has a punishment, but eventually it needs to become a cannot through the impossible rule. They can no longer break the rule because a golf cart cannot physically be used in that way. The programming won't allow it. It's an architecture of sort, in the same way that, you know, you can't stop gravity acting on you, and nor can you, you know, go up to an ATM machine and threaten it with violence in the same way you could, a robber could actually rob a bank. They're different sort of systems there because of the technology in the system. Um, yeah, there was a question. Yeah, I asked a question in the chat. Um, you could solve the problem by having different modes and someone who could uh, select the mode the cart is in, right? Well, yeah, there's always, so, there's always uh, some little workarounds here. But, you know, in the same regard, if there's then programs into the cart saying, you know, emergency mode on or off, there's still ways to get around that. But, no, um, but the modes could be remotely controlled. That's... Uh, that's something, for instance, for this meeting, there's someone in charge of letting people in. Yeah, no, agreed, agreed. Well, I think the example is a bit um, borderline. <laughs> it is, it is. But um, I guess I'm more just trying to illustrate a point around how there could be the best of intentions behind technology. And sometimes it doesn't always actually get deployed in that full way. And, you know, the first run of this may not have that emergency mode and it still has these effects raise questions of liability even and exceptions to rules and the power within them but if nothing else and what i'm trying to get to is that there needs to be this awareness in people using technology and developing technology that actually makes them aware of the full effect they can have so what i'm trying to say is that and i'm almost done and then we we'll grab a few questions but it means that to, as technology increases the states companies individuals they're all going to be getting technology that can allow for this form of technological management to be used in this ever-increasing volume. In the same way that people are, you know, waking up to the ideas of, you know, data and data privacy issues, so too should we start to be aware of these forms of technological management that can be used, abused, and inadvertently misused. And especially when we look at the power it plays in the hands of coders that the coders may not actually be otherwise aware of. So entrepreneurs, including those developing blockchain, fall into the same desire to create certainty in the future by creating structures in the present. While they're using a different type of tool, a different type of code, coders, developers, digital entrepreneurs, there's still a type of profession responding to the same types of human needs. There's a manifestation that human tradition of creating society, order, plans, but one that embraces a modern expression of technology and tools. In this sense, coding captures these deeper functionalities that we ascribe to law. When seeing this through the effect of technological management in that technology, uh, we can actually see this as a restrictive force. Even accidentally, it changes the nature of how it actually developed this technology. I have no solution for this, except to try and spread some awareness of what's happening, to encourage people to think of the law before they actually get to that final beta phase, if at all, and to try and avoid, you know, try to raise the idea that you should probably avoid exploiting, uh, exploiting loopholes where possible, because that's always a surefire way to make sure that the traditional regulators start playing a uh, awful close eye to what you're doing and the innovations taking place. But yeah, that's all for me. I'm open to these questions. I just wanted to run through that. So how would you like to play this, Peter? Yeah, I, um, I think we should do, yeah, let's do some questions if people have any, I, I know I've got a thought about it, but it's not a question, <laughs> so I'll hold that off. Um, so are there any questions? Um, I can see Mark's got his hand up. So, Mark, please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Oh, no, I'm dreadfully sorry I missed the start of the talk. But, uh, and so maybe you've answered it already. But is what you were saying about um, code and um, how coders are a kind of profession that's kind of regulating what the code is doing in a sense, exactly, is that the same uh, kind of thesis that Lesik was talking about when he was trying to talk about code as law? Uh, not how it's often mis misinterpreted, but kind of the central vibe, the main vibe of, of what he was saying originally. Yeah, basically, I draw a lot on Lessig for some of these ideas around his pathetic dog theory and the idea of architecture as a form of code and the pressure on people. But yeah, the, the idea of code as law is this, I, I guess the bit at the start was just the idea that code as law is a theory and concept that a lot of people have, and it's right. used as sometimes an excuse as to why people do what they do. 
um, but also just that it can be more than just that and there's this more than just the code, um, but also understanding that if you think your code is law, that makes you, you know, some who deals with legal instruments and the legal profession has, you know, codes of ethics and we get in a lot of trouble if we do things, but um, those same standards don't always extend to every person doing everything, but more power is being placed in code's hands, which um, doesn't always go with additional awareness of the effect of what they're doing um, for, for better or for worse. Yeah. And I think the point you made about exceptions as well is um, that there's always exceptions and things you didn't really understand about how the system was going to be used in practice. And so yeah, having an ability to fall back to a more manual kind of process is, is often um, one of the main sort of governance mechanisms. Oh, but, exactly. but, but, it, it's, but that also kind of exposes you to something that the kind of the, a lot of people in the blockchain community are fighting against is kind of misuse of power by individuals as well. So I don't know how you balance that. You know, it's tough. And there was one of the things, so again, at, at the start, I explained that um, I followed around a blockchain group for about six months and that's where all my observations and research has kind of been driven from is how they did what they did so it's you know purely gained from one group in one town over six months at time so it's very selective but you get what i mean but um there's one thing which fascinated me or one little tidbit from it was that they there's an idea that um as we transport cattle because it was about the cattle supply chain um we didn't know the effect of what the transportation could have on them so let's use technology to enhance this let's put this on the black blockchain let's try and make it transparent so they in installed um in vehicle monitoring systems into the trucks and the idea for that was we could see the speed we could see the you know potentially what was happening to the cows real time and we can link that straight onto the blockchain the trial was that we were literally seeing the speed of the truck and every time they went 51 in a 50 zone, it went bing, bing, bing. And we knew they were technically driving illegally. If the team is then directly putting that onto a transparent open blockchain, essentially you're putting yourself in the position of enforcement now even, in that you're broadcasting illegal activities. That's not the intention, yeah, but I mean, that's the effect of the technology. You don't even know they're being illegal. You just need to go over the posted speed limit yeah and it might be illegal on the circumstance yeah yeah but it's just more that that type of thinking wasn't always isn't always at the forefront of a design thinking stand and the ability to then kind of inadvertently do that and you know the solution wasn't technological it was you know practical it was economic it was business the idea was that no truck driver would ever want to drive for you if they knew that could potentially happen so the solution was to then kind of run it through a few different systems to where it wasn't on the blockchain or if it was in the blockchain it was simply a yes or a no so it was vague enough to where it wasn't actually reporting on specific potential activities but you know taking that sort of process through it and realize a full effect of what you know technological management systems like blockchain can do is um it's an interesting system interesting process so, so i have a follow-up question uh the problem you just described with the speed recorded and so on it's a problem of privacy so that's that's to me orthogonal to a blockchain system yeah agree it's a privacy thing but also you know privacy can be skirted around through contracts and agreements and those aren't always read <laughs> but no, um... no, I, I agree but uh, so I think overall, uh, the problem is that we are dealing with distributed systems. They have some uh, data and so on. So there's uh, most of the problems in computer science are uh, are in this kind of systems. It's distributed. It's hard to to design. There's the privacy, security, and so on. So there's a lot of things uh, to care about. Agreed. Agreed. So. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I I was thinking about it, and you know, and I think I, so. Back twenty five years ago, I worked in a telecommunication system, and there was a bug in it. So essentially, you know, we had wrote code, there was a design decision, and that ended up having very negative consequences for one person with that telephone system. And it was just you know what happens in this case, and I look at it and I think. 
there was you know lots and lots of people reviewing it in that time now fast forward to the blockchain era any one of us can bang out some code and launch it and people can interact with that code and so you know back that way back then i think someone got a payout of about a million dollars you know because we said whoops you know software bug that sort of seriously hurts you who would have thought you know but now you know how does it work do you think you know should um everyone who wants to launch a contract try and get insurance or something just in case they've got a bug and someone has a negative consequence um you know i mean because it's essentially we're publishing potentially faulty law if you will or faulty rules um so how does that work what are your thoughts well it's interesting because you know if you run the purely basic code is law sort of mentality you know it, it the code is what it is bug and all if there is an exploit it can be exploited and all of this stuff i mean we could even come back to you know the dow back in 2016 2017 um and you know that's a famous exploit where you know did the person actually steal money or did they simply use the system as it was written and that obviously led to the fork but it then led to questions and thoughts about people and the split then obviously involved the ideas of you know these two two different groups of people who had different ideas of what the rules were that yes you can do this because the system says so or no this isn't the system we built we want it to be human centric we want it to be moral we've done this for these you know human centric and socially conscious reasons we shouldn't allow exploits in the same way and i think that that's just kind of how it is you're always going to find people who find both sides to view it and what it then comes down to is liability in that system the coders who built it had a clear liability waiver in the contract they did to create it you know we cannot be held liable to this is that still good enough in today's society well the courts will i guess eventually tell us when these things happen but you know if the, if the code is not liable the person who deployed it isn't liable who, who is is the user liable and this sort of stuff comes into even stuff around you know driverless cars and everything in between which then have such more dramatic consequences around you know human life and everything you know who is liable for what and it's hard to be able to fully um apply the rules straight through so it becomes interesting well another sort of interesting one is so you may have may or may not have there was a hack called the nomad hack mm. which you've heard of and so essentially 200 million dollars was able to be taken so the original hackers from North Korea store, stole, you know, some amounts of money. But then there are things called um, MEV bots, which could essentially look at what was happening and mechanically, so automatically copy what was happening and steal, do the same theft and orchestrate the same um, thieving. And so they stole lots of money as well. All these MEV bots got in. So the big question is then who is so you've got nomad we've got a bug in their code you've got north korean people who obviously ofac are going after but then if you've got a bot that's robotically stealing money for you um or exploiting code is law and all that um yeah where does the you know, where, where do you get to with that oh ai liability directive yeah, it becomes challenging and it really does depend on everything that it depends on the country you're looking at, depends on where it is. And this is then obviously reveals some of the issues with the um, global nature of law and the internet and the failures that that's had every step of the way sometimes of um, it depends on where you draw things from. Like right now in Australia, we're trying to still figure out is if blockchain is even property which then raises interesting ideas around not just, you know, taxation, but inheritance and what can do within assets. But, you know, we have to base it on, you know, Australian definitions of what property is. The UK has come out to then say, well, actually, we can't have it as either of these two things. Let's make it a third thing. And um, we'll see if that magical creation of a third idea actually works. But um, we won't always copy them and we can't do what the US is doing because there's always this long history as to why different countries come up with different things, but they're not always organically transferable, which um, makes it interesting. And liability is no different. So I'd like to say I know the answers, but I don't. <laughs> What's the third thing called if it's not property? And sorry, oh, I've cut you off there. Just as you're asking, the, um, going to ask a question. Yeah, no, there's a there's, uh, chosen action, chosen 
oh, I can't remember the top of my head, but it, it's basically a digital, yeah, it's a data object. That's it. So it's it's a digital form of object, but it's it kind of just taps into the idea of trying to deal with the ephemeral nature of property and you know copyright and IP and patents are this weirder thing which you can't touch, but it still relates to a property right. But then having a data object then kind of tries to capture into this a little bit as this third option. But um, yeah, it's interesting. But yeah, was there another question? Um, my point to sort of run on from something Peter was had raised but go in a sort of slightly different direction with it yeah. you know you're talking about where there's kind of bugs in in the code and and then you know is that is that is now the source of truth I, i've sort of always been interested in the slightly less sexy bit but the uh, attempts by legislators to facilitate the introduction of code um in a way that you know tries to meld them together but starting from the legal end less <clears throat> less so than the technology end so the, the really boring example I've got is the Business Names Registration Act of 2014 that replaced um, systems that had ideas about, uh, you know, people making subjective assessments as to the similarity of existing names and replaced those with a set of mechanical rules with a clearer uh, object to insert a system that would do this instead of needing people to manually review all the applications. Um, that works pretty well 99% of the time, but there are always things that come up that are where, where the system that ASIC has built doesn't line up with what the legislation says. And for most people engaging with that system, what ASIC system does is effectively now law because it doesn't matter what the legislation says. If, if ASIC system tells you, no, you can't have this business name, most people aren't, you know, au fait with the underlying legislation to be able to say, uh, you know, well, no, actually, I understand it can make an argument as to why that name should actually be available and go to the manual decision maker. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about these systems where you sort of, you build a, a legislative framework or potentially a contractual framework, but the thing that then you build on top of that kind of overtakes the thing that it's built on top of. Yeah, no, it's interesting stuff. And it kind of ties into a few things that build on stuff I've already talked about. So work with me <laughs> um so the idea i was talking about before where the um golf cart not being able to go on the green and in a state of emergency you need to be able to decide around this it ties into a different area of legal theory which is known as the core and penumbra it's hla heart and the heart full of debates there's all this interesting um jurisprudential thought but it's the idea that rules need these moments when if there is an emergency something can be brought in that 95% of the time, it's gonna be sitting in this the core idea of the law. And therefore we should be able to have something that can actually automate it, something can work through it and go, yes, that is it, that is it, that is it, move through. But it still needs something sitting on this, this outside the penumbra, basically to say, this is when it should be kicked to a human, this is when it should be moved towards someone who actually knows they're doing and should make a decision. So in law, we see that these days, you know, very, very few actual legal matters go before a judge. It's always settled outside of court. We have these systems where if it fits the bill, we know what it is, we'll go through it. We don't have to argue every step of the way. But if it needs actual discretion, we can then move it to the outside. As we move it to technology, as we move it to automation, it becomes challenging when we don't have the option of speaking to a human. We don't have the option of actually deciding it is an emergency and has to go through it. Or when we do have that, we then have an issue of skill atrophy. So if you take, for example, autopilot, when that was brought in, it was great. Pilots could fly and, you know, it was really useful. But over time, we then had a lot of um, accidents where, oh, I can't remember which flight it was, but it was the one where essentially the system uh, disengaged and it ended up going into a stall, but the pilots weren't aware it was in a stall. So they kept trying to pull it into the stall even more. It all went wrong, crashed, every single person died. But it was because that in that moment when there was a glitch, there was a bug in the system, it threw it back to the human and the human didn't know what to do anymore because if it only ever gives it to you in the exception, you aren't trained on how to do it. And it then means it has these issues. And this is what we're going to deal with, you know, with any sort of automatic code, any sort of system through that, driverless cars, you know, that moment we switch to that higher level where it still has to have the human in the car but only gives it back to an emergency if you get thrown back going everything's going wrong here you go the driver's not going to know what to do anymore but technically that's what the legislation may end up saying yeah I mean, liability the, sit 
my, my mundane business name example, they, there is a category of names that you will get sent to a manual decision maker for. Mm. Um, but there's still uh, errors that lead to, you know, not sending the right things to the decision maker or, you know, granting registration to things that should be refused. Or uh, we've been dealing with one this morning for a client where it looks like it's, it's refusing a name that um, is that there's no good reason for that to be the case and it doesn't line up with the rules that, that are mechanically applied. And if you are, if you're the average, you know, person who is engaging with these systems, you won't know that. And so you don't know to push for the manual decision. You just take the decision at face value. Yeah. But there's, there's still, you know, the decision to send it to a manual decision maker is still a decision that the software can get wrong. Yes. Right. <laughs> No, it is. And that's it. Like the average person just doesn't know that. And even if that system exists, I mean, most government based systems, then governed by admin law, where you have the, um, you know, right to re redress a grievance for different decision making process, and you can kick it to the next person up, you have those systems. But if it's a private company, those things don't always come into it. And, you know, the more and more these systems get hidden and uh, designed so that you can't always talk to the human or, you know, phone numbers are no longer left on websites. So you have to always go through the email or the chat bot. Um, and if those things break, it becomes very challenging. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting process. So the, to go to the um, business name um, question though, do so do most people, I guess, they put in their business name, which should be okay, but because of the bug in the software or the limits of the software, it says no, do people then just come up with a slightly different business name that until it bangs through basically yeah okay makes sense but like even, even just like last week um i was using a platform where i had to create a name and i put um my partner's name in which is cassandra and it rejected it because apparently that name contains a swear word it just denied the ability to actually include <laughs> a name but you know it was just a small platform there's no redress of grievance I just changed it slightly, added only one S instead of two, and it was fine. Yeah, and and Peter, to you know, the, the consequences in the example that I'm raising are not particularly acute. You know, it's one of the few uh, pieces of legislation I'm aware of that has clearly been drafted from scratch to facilitate being implemented by an automated system. That in most cases we're dealing with legacy things that we don't even get to that point, and you've got computer systems trying to you know, insert themselves into processes that weren't ever really designed for that. Yeah. And it even starts to bring in all the stuff around black box systems and the inability to know how it works into it and AI systems and training data and bias. And there's, there's, there's a lot to talk about with all these sorts of systems, especially from a um, legal, sociological, fun sort of perspective. And there's better people than me to discuss that. <laughs> So I had another question, uh, Peter. Uh, and Daniel, you mentioned the automated systems and computer systems. So uh, that's related to my question. Blockchain systems or computer systems are automated systems, right? So for instance, if I buy a fridge or a washing machine, uh, I've got a specification of what the fridge of the washing machine should do. And if it fails, I can claim a, a replacement for a warranty and so on. But uh, I've got an idea what I should expect from the system. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the manufacturer is liable if something goes wrong. So are there similar things happening in, uh, in, in computer systems? Or uh, you've got some specification, for instance, in the software in avionics or in uh, medical software, you have to, to show that you have applied a lot of tools and processes to make sure that your software is uh, as good as it can. Uh, so why can't we do the same thing with computer systems that we can do with uh, these kinds of uh, simple automated systems? It's interesting because, I mean, what you're identifying with a fridge is, you know, consumer law principles, which are interesting if you think about why they exist. So if, if you as an individual buy something worth less than $100,000, which is an ordinary domestic household product, you are covered by the Australian consumer law typically most of the time um but the reason it has those restrictions ordinary household good hundred thousand dollars is because 
if you're buying something which is used exclusively for businesses or worth more than that, the idea is that you're on your own. We don't need to protect you because you're sophisticated enough to know what you're doing. We're here to pr protect, for the most part, the regular, ordinary mum and pop consumers. That's why we have those protections. That's why I have those laws. That's why I have those guarantees. It's why we then have the same stuff with, you know, fundraising and um, prospectus documents and sophisticated investors. The idea is that, you know, if you're sophisticated enough, you don't need these protections. Did, what, did, did you say there was a hundred thousand dollar limit? For Australian consumer law, yes. Wow. What happens if you buy an expensive car? Does that mean you're off on your own if you buy, I don't know, a, a Porsche or something? I mean, not, not, I can't afford a Porsche, so I don't have this problem. Not, but... not legal advice, but perhaps. <laughs> um, it, it used to be 40,000, but it increased like recently ish to 100,000. But um, the idea was, you know, if you're buying something of that nature, that's when you have protections and otherwise you don't. But I guess the idea is that those protections have come in to try and protect those vulnerable people. And that's why we're seeing laws try around the world to try and actually regulate the use of blockchain and blockchain fundraising when it started to actually reach those everyday investors, the FOMO people, the everything who just don't quite know what they're doing, that's when you need to step in and get protections. So what we'll see potentially is code to become a recognizable sort of thing within that system. Potentially you can already get captured under the, you know, um, provision of a service and there's different protections for a service being rendered. If you have someone being hired to create code, it could be that if it fits those bills, but you know, if it's actually fit for purpose, it, it, the law doesn't actually know what those examples are going to be yet. So it needs to kind of figure out what these things are to then know if those protections exist there. And then the government will actually clearly articulate it, hopefully. So we know what protections are there and therefore people will be deliberately designing and building knowing that they have to have those guarantees. Until then, it becomes a little bit of uncertainty, but the more that there's exploitation, there's more that there's vulnerable people, the more likely the law will kind of shift quicker to catch up. It can be very slow in some areas and very fast in others. But yes, hopefully that addresses a little bit of the, the thoughts you have. And, uh, well, and very quickly, Frank, as well, the, uh, there was a decision uh, with the, regarding STEAM in Australia that uh, I believe did say that um, you know, consumer software like video games can be a consumer good to, that the consumer guarantees apply to and that you can't say no refunds if the game is faulty. Uh, but, but those limits that Lachlan was talking about, obviously, uh, you know, limit how that might apply to things that aren't necessarily consumer goods. Yeah, definitely. There's a fun little um, areas of law around, it was one which dealt with carpets, where it was a business that bought a carpet for the business, but it was still protected because, you know, carpet is things you have around the house. We'll protect that. But then there was another woman who bought like this big industrial printer, which was, you know, normally, you know, not, not that expensive, but because it was only ever sold to businesses, it was still deemed to be a, um, not an ordinary good. So it wasn't actually protected under the same consumer laws because the suppliers and manufacturers design it for that level of sophisticated purchaser, not for the everyday people. So the question becomes almost, you know, if you're engaging with code and having code created, are you this sophisticated person who should know what they're doing or are you the everyday investor hiring for a service? And it's unclear what that is and it's going to keep shifting as code gets used in different ways. Well, uh, and in, given your, um, your explanation, so one of the really big hacks, a $600 million hack was the Ronin hack, and that was all related to a computer game. So it's a, the idea is if on, on the blockchain, you, you, your ownership of certain articles within the computer game are shown by, you know, ownership of these things on the blockchain. And so, you know, the idea is then you're allowing a secondary market trading and all that sort of business um, and play to earn. But if all the value of all these things on the blockchain suddenly go to zero because someone's done a $600 million hack, then, um, you know, because you can imagine that could be covered by consumer law because surely a computer game, like similar to the Steam thing, would be deemed a, you know, like a normal consumable item. Um, and that kind of comes back to the definition of the property in that, you know, do you still have access to that item on the system? Yes, you do. 
but is it still worth the same thing that you thought it was worth? No, because the trust and systems deteriorated. There's everything's been taken out of it. It's been siphoned out, but you still have access to that bit of code. So the Steam example is, do you have access to the code? Can you get it returned? Yes, yes. But is the same thing with the blockchain? It, it becomes this uncertainty because it's a different type of asset. And if that's property, does it have inherent value to it? It becomes a little more unclear as to where it is. I mean, one thing we see as well is in, say, um, our family law settlements. If one of the people owns Bitcoin, how does that get distributed as an asset in the event of a divorce? I mean, at what point in time does that get calculated as to how much value it is if the assets have to be sold off? It becomes this uncertain moment of, I mean, well, it was, I think it was well with the um, the Mount Gox stuff around the mismanagement of the uh, the bankruptcy they went through. And, you know, did they have the right, did they have the um, owners to actually sell it at the right moment in time or did they hold on to it too long? And therefore, did they mismanage it as a, um, as a trustee? All these sorts of questions are, Fascinating, but um, hard to have answers to. Yeah, okay. Thank you for um, a great talk and an even a really exciting Q&A time. I think that was really good. Um, could you share your slides again? Yes. And I'll show that um, future talk slide and talk through that. Yeah, this is the one. All right, so thank you again, Lachlan. You, that was a great talk. Um, next week, we've got a uh, final year student from University of New South Wales, I believe, who has been doing an evaluation of smart contract tools for their final year thesis. Um, and they're presenting next week. Then we've got Ermius, who's going to talk about um, cross-chain security. And on November 2nd, straight after that, we've actually got um, some people talking about the ZK Bridge um, project, which um, should be really interesting because that should lead us towards trustless bridges. And um, I've been having to play around with a lot of ABI encoding recently, so I thought I'll do a talk on it. And then um, we've got a whole stack of like extra pro um, talks after that on all sorts of things. And um, so great lineup of talks coming up. And I think there's one more slide. Um, yep, so if you, yep, that's the one. Um, so if you're here today and you want to watch this on YouTube from the start, um, go to that YouTube link, uh, the Ethereum Engineering Group on YouTube. Um, you can join the Slack workspace and um, in, engage in conversation there about this talk and other talks. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can freely join the meetup group and come along to any and every talk. Um, there's example code, which contains many of the examples that you're seeing. Um, if you're interested in formal methods, especially formal methods as applies to blockchain, then Frank, Joanne and others um, have a group that meet every week or two or three. Um, and um, to learn more about that, join the Slack workspace and go to the formal methods reading group on channel on that workspace. And so you can stop sharing again. And so, yeah, thank you again, Lachlan. That was a great talk. So, um, yeah, thank you. No worries. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, have a great um, week, everyone, and talk to everyone later. Bye-bye.